This microphone is going to be the microphone. Check the mic. Check the microphone. I know it's not going to be that microphone because it's a default. Okay, we're not sure if you can hear this microphone. <laughs> so anybody out there listening, go on and see. Uh, I need you to just tell me if you can hear me because I hooked up a microphone and we're not sure that it's connecting to the computer. Um, so here we go. <laughs> I am uh, here tonight in Canada and I'm wearing my skunk hat. Yes, uh, it is uh, really, really cold here. Our family took a... Uh, last minute vacation uh it was on monday before christmas and my husband said let's uh, hop in the car we're gonna go on a train ride so the family took a few moments to uh just pack really quickly and know that we were heading to a really 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 cold um part of the country and off to the border we went can you hear me okay we think that you can hear me turn that fan off please all right, so this is what happens when you record from a hotel room and you do have some great teenage sons that are trying to help me. But I'm gonna tell a little bit about the adventure we went on and some of the reasons we chose to go to Canada. Uh, we went to a place uh, called Churchill and I don't know if you can see it very well in the background. So I'm gonna scoot my table a little closer. And uh, I can't really see that very well, can you? Um, the can you focus this walker? All right, so what happened what, with uh, a, a trip to Canada is uh, we went and I've talked a lot about how the ketogenic diet isn't this new wave idea. It's actually a very native diet. Um, my family and I are from South Dakota, so we know a lot about the life on the plains and grew up reading books like Little House on the Prairie and you look at the native culture from South Dakota and they talk a lot about having a huge uh, hunter-gatherer history, uh, but then you get to reading about how much that hunter-gatherer history is really part of their culture and I think we should focus on the hunter part of it. When you look at the, look at the diet that's associated with life on the plains uh, for hundreds of years, it has a lot of similarities to the ketogenic diet. And when I hear um, when I hear the naysayers about the ketogenic diet say you need to eat lots of vegetables to get your carbohydrates, um, I, uh, I love bringing back the focus to what it was over 150 years ago. And with that being said, the Inuit culture is where we went to um to for our little, little vacation so walker can you please uh change this for me so i've got a picture of my sons here in the background this is in churchill manitoba and you can see them here but uh it's kind of really bright um uh, it's not focused very well mm, so go to the map so if you haven't looked up churchill manitoba i had never looked it up either but it has uh a place on the map that is incredibly cold. Like the temperatures for our adventure were negative 50. And we got to be around uh, uh, the natives up there who are used to living in such cold weather. They said, it's only 58 degrees. It's only, I mean, 58 below <laughs> with wind chill factor. Uh, we took a three day train ride up there. So we got to see a lot of, uh, of Canada, which I had never seen before. And it looked a lot like South Dakota, <laughs> but we also got to visit with several of the uh, natives in Churchill, Manitoba. So it's on the Hudson Bay and you cannot get there by driving. You can only get there by train or by, um, uh, by plane. And as luck would have it, they have had quite a history recently um, on what their uh, train delivery has been um, blunted. So uh, they had it had been offline. The train was not working for about 18 months. And so the native people there, or the people who live there even had more difficulties in the last two years about how to get their their food and their culture uh, and their, their, you know, can they sustain living in the Arctic? Uh, and how would they do that? Uh, Walker, uh, if you could... Uh, 
take a look at this. Just I want you to notice that it's with, look at the computer with me. So some things that I want to show off are what we did up there. So if you'll go to the one, because I don't think they can see that very well. But if you could go to the one where you were doing the dog sled. So we got a hold of somebody, a, a, a mushin, which is a man who is in charge of dog sledding. And he, uh, if you can blow it up. Uh, he was Mr. McDonald, and he took my boys uh, uh, on a dog sled ride. There's 10 dogs there. You can see uh, one, little, one little boy here, and this is my elder son, and then this is the motion, Mr. McDonald over here. <laughs> Quite an adventure. It was only 40 minutes on a dog sled ride, and everybody came back with frozen eyelashes, and uh, Mr. McDonald's beard was all frozen, uh, but the dogs were incredible. Uh, uh, how well they were able to sustain in that cold weather at negative 50 below. Um, the other part about being in this area that was uh, has always been interesting to me was to study um, how this diet uh, is a sustainable diet. When I hear do a lot of reading and a lot of teaching about the ketogenic diet, you'll hear, oh, that diet is just not sustainable. You've got to have your carbohydrates. You have to have fruits and vegetables. And again, like I said at the beginning of this, I've had a life in South Dakota where living on the plains shows you that whatever natives did uh, live here didn't have much for fruits and vegetables. Uh, it, it is a great place now where we have modern agriculture to grow grains. But if you go back to where the native culture was 150 years ago, that's there's not very many grains, there's not very many berries, uh, and they're very seasonal. So um, I come into the new year and look at New Year's resolutions. I have lots of patients saying, I'm going to be ketogenic for 2019. And um, what I tell patients is heading towards a ketogenic diet is an incredibly, it is sustainable, but it does take some education about how that was possible. Um, as I look at um, the Inuits, which is one of the reasons that we chose to go to Churchill, Manitoba, uh, it's a very heavy Inuit culture there. Uh, those are the natives from that area. And you get to see how they lived off of a very ketogenic diet for um, for generations uh, until modern, modern medicine and modern uh, eating came about. Um, if you can go to the Northern Lights one, uh, you get to see that they have the benefit of uh, some beautiful landscapes up there. And um, there's not, not a lot of population, but uh, the, the, the night sky it was really cold while we were there. And this is a picture of the Northern Lights while we were there. Uh, and you can see Churchill Way in the background there. Um, uh, not perfectly on this, uh, this camera, but... Here's a better picture too of the Northern Lights. This was out of the train that we were, we took this out of the inside of a train. Uh, and this was last night of the Northern Lights, just incredible picture. So the purpose of what I wanted to cover tonight, if you can leave that picture up there, Walker, that'd be great. Um, the purpose of what I wanted to cover tonight though, for, um, for covering a few things on the ketogenic diet is I'm going to have Walker take a look at some of the questions that are coming in and he's going to read a couple of them. After I go through, um, uh, how is this diet sustainable? And some of the myths that I get to hear, um, you know, one of the, as much as 2019, we're heading into um, uh, a brand new year. And I would say this is probably the fourth year, 2015 is when I really first kind of started to get my mind around a ketogenic diet. Uh, early 2016 is when I started to, to live a ketogenic lifestyle. And so now we're three or so years into this. And you'll hear a lot of my colleagues say, oh, that's another fad diet, that's never, that's not sustainable. But I will contend as an internal medicine physician, this is what I recommend for all of my patients with chronic disease. And I just like to take care of some of the myths out there that this is not sustainable. So a sustainable diet is one that we not only can do for a, a, um, many years, but also that is accompanied by not having um, nutritional de defects. So the first nutritional defect that 
I hear people bring up all the time is, how would you get your vitamin C if you don't eat fruits and vegetables? Um, if you don't think that there's naysayers about this diet, I would encourage you to go to the YouTube video that's, that says fruit is evil. And I just think they read the title. They didn't listen to <laughs> it at all and just said, um, you know, unsubscribing or something you know, very negative on that YouTube video that I did explaining that uh, fruit today is uh, very bioengineered to meet the demands of our culture, which is heavy on the sugar, quick, sweet taste early in the in the bite of fruit, not lots of fiber. Um, and then the brighter and more vibrant the, the color of the fruit, the better it sells. So if you go back 150 years, you find watermelons that are the size of a grapefruit. You'll find that there's a lot of rind inside the watermelon. There's more like eight or 10 bites of a watermelon inside it, as opposed to the ones we buy at the grocery store today. If you look at bananas, um, they too are filled with fiber, filled with seeds, and have more of a bitter taste um, in their original form, as opposed to the ones that are engineered today, which are very high in sugar and very um, uh, vibrant. Uh, they're, they're much more yellow, whereas the native ones are filled with fiber and they are uh, they're, they're more, more grainy, more pasty, I think is the right word. Um, and you say, well, you know, don't you need fruit to survive? And I think going to a place like Churchill, Manitoba, uh, has been a great place for me to slow down and just read about their culture and how they would eat. And some of the things that they did to preserve the meats that they would, um, that they would hunt and then to watch how uh, they did have very healthy lives. Um, there's a couple of uh, um, uh, people who traveled there and lived with the Inuits in the early 1900s. One specifically who came back and said, you know, I know that vitamin C has just been discovered. This is in the, like the 1920s. Um, and that scurvy happens when you don't have vitamin C, but these natives are living where there isn't fruits and vegetables and they don't have scurvy. And I lived with them uh, for the better part of a year and I didn't get scurvy either. And his colleagues all said, oh, he must be lying. And so he actually checked himself into a hospital in New York City and said, I'll live here for an, a year and you can watch me eat a high fat which is 85% fat he was eating, uh, 75 to 85% fat he was eating, 25% uh, protein and no carbohydrates. Um, that was how they generalized it. Uh, and he didn't get scurvy. He did that for a year. Um, now you go back and read the documentaries on his work and you find lots of his colleagues say very disparaging things about, you know, he must have cheated or there was, it couldn't have been true and you can't believe anything he says. Uh, but in fact, that uh, continues to be the case when you look at how the meats are preserved in native culture. Um, they take the meats, they dry, they air dry them, and then they would take the fat from these uh, animals, whether it was seal, or the blubber from seal or from whale, um, or even from buffalo. And they would pour the hot fat over that dried meat, and that would seal the meat. Uh, and sterilize it. And you could keep that meat for up to a year. Uh, some would say even uh, multiple years um, when it was sealed in that fat. And that's how the preservation of that meat would allow the nutrients to be preserved, but also to um, be able to roam uh, the plains, you know, 150 years ago. And they really did have healthy bodies, healthy teeth. That's one of the other things that I've been looking forward to some blog articles I'm going to do in the next several months. And uh, one of them is going to be on uh, skin and the amazing amount of research that we have on how much better your skin is with lower carbohydrate diet, um, but also how much better your teeth are uh, when ketones are in your saliva and with when your carbs are low. Uh, so as I look at uh, some of the um, some of the challenges that our family had over the last week, we hopped on this train. It was kind of an impromptu visit. Um, we took some meat and cheese on our train ride, which was like almost, almost three days long. And on the train, there was 
plenty of carbs offered and processed food, but that meat and cheese was really what um, I tried to stick to for the diet. Um, and then um, I fell off the wagon and had carbs and processed food because we ran out of the meat and cheese or it became this taste I didn't want to have anymore. Uh, we get up to Churchill, Manitoba, and um, it was uh, actually quite impressive how lean their native population was. Um, as much as processed foods are very much uh, have access in the place in South Dakota, um, and our native culture has a huge problem in my my clinic and the clinics across my state with diabetes and high sugars. Um, we got to interview several of the natives uh, from. Uh, Manitoba, uh, from Churchill, Manitoba, and they were lean and had uh, actually very ketogenic type diets that they still used. Um, as I look at uh, a couple of, of goals that I wanted to share tonight, um, we're going to go through questions. Walker's got a couple of them lined up here in just a minute, but I just wanted to share a couple of, of goals. If you're looking at a ketogenic diet for 2019, um, I uh, do these things on Sunday. Tonight is a traveling day, and uh, I'm actually just trying to get back into ketosis after six, what is this, six days with the family on the road and probably not very ketogenic. Um, but I did have... Um, uh, you know, plenty of times where for the last two and a half years, my body is very used to producing ketones. And I know that it won't take long for me to get back into ketosis. But I set a couple of goals for myself as well. And I would encourage you to you to do this. Um, when looking at a ketogenic diet, you can have um, uh, this these big goals. Like I've had patients come in and say, starting 2019, I'm going to be ketogenic the whole year. And to kind of bring this full circle, I would contend that not even the natives who lived a, an Inuit or a very um, uh, high fat diet, they had times where berries were in season, but it was once a year. They had times where carbohydrates were in their life, but it was for a short period of time. So what, what I am content, what my goal is for 2019 isn't to say something as grand like every day in 2019, I'm going to make sure I'm producing ketones. Uh, now, I would love to do that. That's that it is a goal. But I think a shorter goal is much better. I'm going to start today with uh, being a, in a ketogenic um, diet for for today. Usually on Sundays, I start a fast, but um, I'm still on the road. Uh, we uh, are haven't we have to travel back to South Dakota yet. And so fasting while in the car with the family after multiple days of not being ketogenic is probably not fair to do to my family. Um, but my goal for the year is that each Sunday I do sh I do push record whether or not the microphone works or whether or not I've got um, uh, an audience or not is to say on Sundays, I think it's been a huge testimony to say what happens when you stand up and say, here's an example of how to live a ketogenic life. And here's some some of the science as to why that is a good idea. So my goal is each Sunday to show up at six o'clock and announce my fasts, announce why I'm fasting that week and to set realistic goals uh, to to. Uh, set the progress of improving autophagy, uh, improving mental performance, which is why I'm ketogenic, and being an example to patients that I'm trying to model behavior saying this is possible to go without carbohydrates and to do fasting um, in today's world. And um, the, the other reason that when you're looking for a 2019 goal, set a why. What is your why? Why are you doing this? And if it's just to get into a, the next size, uh, smaller clothing, that's not a bad why, but there's a much bigger uh, goal out there that um, would last through the difficult times. I've found that when you're looking at time spent with grandkids or time spent with um, friends um, or a, a health problem that you're trying to reverse some medications for, that those daily symptoms turn out to be a much stronger why. And when you're getting to moments where those carbs look tempting, um, getting through it has a lot to do with your why. So I would encourage you to find your why, write it down. Um, I'd love you to post it in the YouTube just to see why people are doing a ketogenic diet. It truly helps me 
uh, to see who my audience is. Um, and I swear I'm going to get lots better at this YouTube stuff over the next year. Uh, the learning curve has been very steep. We hit over 80,000 people following this channel now. And in October, I had 2,000 people. So I'm just really thankful for everybody that's clicked subscribe. I have a personal goal that in the, by 2020, there are a million people that are learning about the ketogenic diet through this channel. That's a really big goal, but I do believe that education is the way to improving people's health. So if you haven't checked out uh, my blogs on this or the book I wrote, I encourage you to do that. Uh, it is my favorite teaching tool. And that's how I'm counting students is by clicking subscribe on this channel. So speaking of teaching, let's get to some questions. Walker, what's- We have one about the Inuits which is like super relevant. So it's from Todd P from Florida who said, the Inuits mostly ate meat and fat. What are your thoughts on a zero carb slash carnivore diet? Right, so carnivore diet is totally what the Inuits did. Uh, again, Inuits are the native, uh, the native people that live in Northern Canada and they didn't have access to carbohydrates. It's where I started out this, blog, this uh, video, maybe not as organized as I could have been, the, the people on the plains said they were hunter gatherers, but really they were hunters. And it is um, the first thing you'll hear people say is, oh, that's not sustainable. You need fiber, you need vitamin C. And I would contend that these people lived off of a carnivore diet um, for generations and did so in a very healthy way. Um, when people are just starting a ketogenic diet, it sounds really difficult to reach out for zero carbs. I would um, say it's a it's a graduation step. So when people say, "What do I think? Do you should you do that?" I would master the twenty carbs or less first. Really find yourself in a good rhythm before you step into that full carnivore diet. Um, and then it does mean that you should probably be eating that organ meat. One of the reasons that the natives were able to do this and not be low on their vitamins is they kind of they ate nose to tail on their carcasses. They didn't waste, um, they ate the bone marrow, they ate organ meat. And we tend to eat like the chicken breast and throw the rest of the bird away. So if you're gonna do carnivore, it does take some, some attention to uh, really eating all of that meat in a way that gets you the vitamins. Next question. Okay, so before I get to the other questions, Everyone in the comments doesn't know what your hat is. Your hat. <laughs> okay, so my hat is from a South Dakota native, and it is a five pelt skunk hat. Uh, it is um, one of my favorite hats, <laughs> and it's the closest thing that I have to staying warm when you go up to Canada. So you can see that it is a skunk hat. I love this hat. <laughs> so it is a five pelted skunk hat. And it is uh, so warm. Like when we were up in Canada, it was seriously 50 below zero. And <laughs> 50 below zero means you have three breaths until you freeze the nose hairs. But you wear hats like this, which is what, you know, the, all of them up their head skins on, whether it was seal or, um, you know, not even sure what all those things they were wearing, but everybody had uh, pelts on. Uh, and you can see why it is super cold. Like on our trip home, our little train froze. Actually, it was an electrical problem, but it was because it was 50 below zero. And then we had to take a plane off of the train to get to Manitoba. <laughs> I was going to do this this cast from the train. Uh, and that that's why we're not at the train right now. So it is skunk. And it's one of my favorite, <laughs> favorite hats. My husband bought this for me probably about four years ago now. So steel... Bogman wants to know, he's trying to adapt to ketosis as a truck driver. He wants mm -hmm. to know your suggestions. Yes, absolutely. So truck drivers, you're one of my favorite people. I have uh, a, my husband's family ha and I, a part, as part of that, have a huge uh, affection for truck drivers across the country. And I'll tell you, you guys come up with some of the nastiest habits, <laughs> whether it's sleep apnea or sitting too long. But as a truck driver, you do have some... Uh, you know, the, the most important part is that your brain stays focused for all of those hours of driving. So I do recommend a ketogenic diet. And I have several truck drivers who have gone from this high carb feed glucose every three hours, snack on carbs as they drive, have those big tummies that look like they're pregnant. In a year, they have been ketogenic and have lost a, an enormous amount of weight, uh, taken away their blood pressure medicines. I'll tell you one of the first things that I 
I encouraged my ketogenic drivers to do was start with pepperoni and cheese. Uh, the reasons why is it's a high fat meat um, that you can find them at the truck stops. And they, uh, it's, those are perfect ketogenic. They have great flavor. They have great satiety. Um, I also, um, in my truck drivers, if they're going to drink something, I, I do recommend that they use the exogenous ketones. Um, great amount of just sweetness if they need a, a, a sweet drink, but it keeps their brain focused for about four hours after taking it. So if you're going to transition, there's a few things that most of my truck drivers are all on high blood pressure medicines. So be careful when you first transition, they lose a lot of water weight and their blood pressure can go down if they're not paying attention. So um, the other thing that I tell them is really good you can find in truck stops is pickled eggs. So they take, uh, you know, the pickle juice and they took boiled eggs and put them in there. And those are totally ketogenic and they help with uh, just feeling that, that salty um, satiety when they eat uh, salt plus fat, which is in the egg yolk. That's a good question. Um, here's one. So, uh, this is from Peggy Utley. She wants to know if you're in ketosis, should the test strips stop registering since your body is using all the ketones? Right. Good question. This is from Peggy and she wants to know about those test strips when you first start a ketogenic diet. Again, this is where I recommend it, folks start. I don't recommend you go out and buy a whole bunch of tests, you know, blood testing kit. When you first begin, I say spend 15 bucks on urine test strips. And what will happen is these urine test strips, when you pee on them, they will turn pink if there's ketones in your urine. And at first, you take away those carbohydrates, your body produces ketones, either from the fat that you're eating or the fat that's now mobilized out of storage. Uh, fat, as it's used as energy, is ketones. And when you first transition, your body produces way more than you know how to use. So in order to keep your body from getting acidic or from getting too many ketones, uh, you get rid of them in two ways. You can breathe them out, and that's where that strange smell in your breath happens at the beginning of a ketogenic diet. People can say, I know I'm in ketosis, I can smell it in my breath. Those are ketones in the form of acetone that's coming out of your breath. The other place that your body wastes ketones is in your urine. And it's because it doesn't want too many ketones in the blood system that can really change the acid base of your body. And the way you counteract that is you, uh, you get rid of them. After about two or three weeks, the body says, okay, now I've adapted and my mitochondria can use these ketones and the ketone level will come down. Sometimes that pink strip goes from a really nice dark ketone that I'm like, doc, I'm in ketosis. Look at how dark my urine strip is. And then over the next week or so, maybe two weeks, it gets in this light pink. And it's because the amount of ketones you're producing versus the amount that you're using match better. You don't spill as many into the urine. Uh, I think it's a really rare moment when you don't spill any. Uh, think of, remember that the urine is collected in the bladder, which is how many ketones have been uh, matching your needs over the last maybe four or five hours, however long it's been since you've gone to the bathroom. So people say, oh, my urine has never got ketones in it anymore. It's because I'm keto adapted. And I would say that's really difficult to have zero ketones in your urine if you're on a ketogenic diet. So those urine test strips should turn at least a light pink. I do think it's a better accurate ability to check through the blood monitoring. And that's uh, where I would say the second phase of if you want to get a little more hardcore is to check the blood me blood measurements. I wouldn't recommend that you do that out of the gate, though. I would recommend you check urine ketone strips for two to three weeks um, and you will get the hang of it. It's cheaper. It's easier. There's lower barrier to checking. Uh, you can put a few in your pocket when you start the day. And just if you don't use them by the end of the day, you can throw them away. All right, let's do one more question. Oh. So we actually two more. So two more. A okay, really two fast more questions. Fire one is Gloria Gross is about the key thing. So I was like, okay, we can do this one really quick. So she just got the four cure monitor, the link oh. in the description. She wants to know if you still use the P sticks in between the four care. You know, um, I would I would not. If, if you've graduated to the blood testing, um, what you get with blood testing is you get this ratio, especially when you do the four care, you can check the glucose and you can check the ketones. So that gets you into what is your ratio? What is your Dr. Boz ratio? Which is, you mean you take the glucose and you divide by the ketones. If your number is 80 or less, 
we know that that's a really good phase for weight loss. If your number is 40 or less, then that's a really good number for anybody who's got metabolic issues or has autoimmune issues or an immune system that's just failing. And if you're like Grandma Rose, who's got cancer, I we push them to a ratio of 20 or less. Um, once you've graduated to the blood testing, I haven't gone back to the urine ketone strips. Uh, it's just not as accurate. Uh, I think at the beginning of the diet, it's too overwhelming for patients to do all these changes in their diet, plus be checking their, their sugars and their ketones. So that's why I do this in phases to stick with the urine ketone strips at the beginning. If you do step up to that higher level, uh, I don't use those. You're, you can give them to a friend and say, here, you start. Because, yeah, that's a good thing. So we're going to, last question is about apple cider vinegar. So a lot of people are going to ask about that. Um, this one specifically comes from I want a girl. She wants to know, does apple cider vinegar help lower glucose numbers? So apple cider vinegar is, again, a very uh, um, acidic pH. Um, I think of this as like kombucha. I don't know if you if if you remember the the fasting drinks I did a while ago saying I make kombucha at our house too, and as that um, bacteria uh, processes the sugar in kombucha, it makes it more and more like vinegar. So apple cider vinegar is a pH somewhere around like 2.4, 2.8. Um, kombucha we want it to be around 3.1, 3.2. So again, very acidic pH. Uh, what I find that it does is it does lower uh, the craving for sugar. So when people say, what, what is the science behind apple cider vinegar? It takes a certain dosing to get some of the outcomes that people want. Uh, what I know for sure is even the smallest doses of a, an apple cider vinegar uh, really lower that craving for a, a sweet taste. I found this to be quite universal and uh, a reproducible um, outcome for apple cider vinegar. Um, but it's a good question because it comes up a lot and there are no, there are no carbohydrates in, uh, apple cider vinegar. So that helps too. All right. Well, so this podcast or this, uh, <laughs> this YouTube was from my hotel room in Manitoba, Canada. Here's to, uh, the trappers who got me this wonderful skunk cat a few years ago and to staying warm while in, uh, the tundra and the Arctic. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, we will check in next week and um, I will be fasting again starting next Sunday. Thank you. Good night.